We all need a shot of encouragement to keep us going. A new beginning with Greg Laurie is sure to help in your journey of faith. Hear it twice daily. Details at vision.org.au. A biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. We might spare a thought today for the noble profession of school teaching. And we might be concerned with what's happening in our education system. Some of us may be able to reflect on earlier times when the reputation of our schools and our teachers as places of learning were somewhat better. And while there may be a lot of people unhappy with the system today, there does not appear to be a lot of clarity on what the best response might be. Last month, the final report of a Senate inquiry into the increasing disruption in Australian school classrooms was released. And our special guest today is calling for a further inquiry into declining academic standards. Dr. Paul Kidson is an Australian Catholic University Senior Lecturer in Educational Leadership. He's also a former school principal. And it's our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Kidson to 2020 today. Dr. Paul, welcome. Thanks, Andrew, for having me along. It's a great joy and uh, glad for the opportunity to explore some of these, as you've rightly said, some critical conversations. Yeah, we, uh, we have listeners all across Australia. Paul, as I said in the introduction, many of us listening right now are parents And I think it's fair to say many of us have become frustrated with the education system today. What are two or three of the biggest challenges or problems that you see in modern education in Australia? So I think there's a really macro one, and you highlighted it in the entry. Uh, The fact that there's dissatisfaction, but no clarity about what the solution to that is. And I think until we've got some sense of where we're going, sailors have a great saying, if you don't know where you're going, any wind is fair. You just kind of head off. So we've got people who are, you know, wanting a lot of change, but for not necessarily a clarity of purpose for that. There's been a big rise, and I think rightly so, around what is broadly referred to as a science of reading or science of learning. And that speaks to the fact that some people have thought, Literacy standards have declined. We've got PISA, which is an international benchmark uh, standardised test. That's declined over the the, uh, last couple of decades or so. And so people are saying, we've got a lot of emphasis on literacy, a lot of emphasis on the ability to read and write. And that's all great. But to what end? And I think that's the biggest missing part of a lot of the conversation. A lot of the conversation is we need kids to be able to access the breadth of the curriculum. There's richness in the curriculum. There's extraordinary opportunities and visions and history, mathematics, science, geography. There's a whole great deal of humanity. If you don't have good literacy skills, you can't access that. So tick for that. But what is the message that is laid through those other areas of the curriculum? And and how does that uh, both reveal our perspective, our what many of us in this field for many years have called our worldview, and indeed, What sorts of other conversations are there when we are part of a society where not everybody, Andrew, just thinks like us and not everybody uh, is is required to think like us? So it's not just about how do I as an individual live in a way that's reflective of my commitment to following Jesus, but how do I live being that person in a community next to neighbours and in schools where other people might have very differing views about that? And that's a real social, relational, community focus, which often is lost in the very strong emphasis that we've had over the last two decades on things like NAPLAN and PISA. They're the tools. They're not the goal. And I think a major shift that we want to see in some of this conversation is let's talk about goals, let's talk about purpose, let's talk about meaning and put those into their right place, whereas these are the tools uh, to equip us on the journey towards that. Yeah, okay, so you, you made a lot of points there, but it, you know that, that what you just quoted then for the last 20 years, standards of literacy in Australia and, and maths, I believe, have declined. Now, everyone knows that. Politicians know that, bureaucrats know that, school principals know that. But what are people saying is the reason for that? Has anyone been able to identify the key reason why our standards have dropped, despite the fact that we're one of the most funded education systems in the world? Well, there's some really curious data that the OECD put out, and 
PISA, which is that, that program of international student assessment, is one of them. But there's two other really compelling parts of data that doesn't get much of a look in. And one of them that was released only at the end of last year showed that the number of hours that Australian students spend in school is one of the highest globally. Now, you put that together and say, we're spending longer in school, but we're not having the kind of outcomes that you would think would lead to that. That's a real conundrum, Andrew. And we don't have any simplistic, uh, to, to use your, your language there, one key answer to that, but it begs a serious question. Now, there are a number of different responses, and I'll give you just a handful of them for the sake of time. Um, one of them is that, ironically, we talk about evidence-based informed policy. Well, the evidence is that since we've had a massive focus on these standardised tests, the results on those tests have actually declined. There was a report just this week, a media report this week, um, about the anxiety that that's caused for a number of students because they're going through this perpetual regime of testing and without much time for actually doing any of the learning. You know, one of those jurisdictions that's consistently held up for some type of uh, exemplar is Singapore. Well, Singapore have actually moved away from having a really rigid standardised testing regime because what they saw was exactly that. Kids were focused purely on getting through the test and so they great, might have great test scores, but they've not got social skills, they've not got relational skills and they've not got the ability to form a good life as it is. And so that's where there's a real tension because in some regard, having great outcomes in those tests is again, begs the question, to what end? And so that's where a lot of this emerging evidence says we have a lot of social and emotional concerns. You go back two, two decades as well, there is nothing like the focus on well-being that there has been over the last uh, half dozen years in particular. We could talk about the impact of uh, digital technologies. You know, it's now 16 years since we had the digital education revolution and the argument suggests that that hasn't necessarily produced anything like the outcomes that are proposed. So again, you've got jurisdictions around the globe like Sweden, like Norway, who are starting to say, maybe we should be ditching so much of this digital devices and get back to reading and handwriting because they're different cognitive processes that make me assimilate the information in a much more robust way. And we now get too much of this kind of tick, flick, scan, uh, you know, swipe, uh, shallow engagement. Uh, a few years back, a, a scholar called Johan Hari published a book called Stolen Focus with this notion that we don't have an ability to be able to sustain long-term large-scale questions and ideas and, and stories. And yet, ironically, it's hard these days to jump onto a streaming platform and get any kind of movie in 90 minutes. They're all eight and 10, 55-minute episodes. So the actual, we, we've actually got a really good capacity for long storytelling, but it's not in the way that we thought of it. And that's why an emphasis purely on the PISA results and their decline sparks questions rather than it is solutions because the causes of them are so rich and complex. Yeah, well, I mean, as a parent, I could always see that my kids went to a state school here in Brisbane that was in a fairly affluent area. And as seemed to be the trend up here, the affluent areas, the state schools did really well in NAPLAN. I think my kids' school, I won't mention it, came fourth in the state for NAPLAN. But it sort of looked to me like the schools that did well in NAPLAN, there was a push towards doing well in NAPLAN, as you said. And I, I guess the principals and the schools are judged by the education system on the NAPLAN results. And so it felt to me like there was a big push on doing well in NAPLAN, but that didn't necessarily translate into uh, better outcomes in the education process of my kids. That was just my observation as a parent. It looked to me like a political thing that the government initiated to try and improve standards, but it didn't necessarily get the outcome. That was my observation anyway. If you, if you set a goal... And, and and this year in particular for your listeners, Andrew, is one that I would draw their attention to the politics about this because, um, and then some might glaze over at this, I, I get that. But this year, governments across the country are going to be argy-bargy about who gets what money and to what end. It's a national school reform agreement. Now, over the last few decades, where we've had, I think, well-intended priorities 
we do want kids to have strong literacy skills. We do want kids to have strong mathematics, numeracy skills, because they're fundamental. I don't want my carpenter not to know Pythagorean geometry when they're putting up my house. I don't want my airline pilot to make a miscalculation error um, because my life is in their hands. So these things have got real practical uh, impact. But some of those unintended consequences were the times and pressures that have been spent in schools prepping for them. I, look, and these are anecdotes, and you will have your own anecdotes, as will your families. But to hear from a senior educator in one state, not from them involved in a school themselves, but a story they were told of kids that had been told, please don't come and do the NAPLAN tests. Now, one of the reasons for that is, is if I've got a simple number, let's call them 20 kids, yep. and four of them aren't going to be crack hot on the tests, and if I get them to stay home, then my average is going to look red hot. Yeah. And so there's this manipulation that goes on. An alternative to that is this preparation, this this drilling, this rote preparation of those tests, which helps you to be able to do those tests really well. But the transference of that learning, the transference of those skills into new environments is more questionable. And then, of course, we've already talked about some of the issues of the anxiety and the stress. And some of the beneficiaries of this have been private tutoring colleges because they've made a market out of how can I help get your kids the best results in NAPLAN. Some schools, and I was the principal of one that had a primary section with three streams, and then it went to five streams in year seven. And our results between year, year five and year seven NAPLAN were sensational. And until I said to my school council, you know, it's not that we've just turned these kids around in like, you know, 10 weeks and made them geniuses. It's because a whole bunch of new kids have come to the school and it skewed the mathematics of the population. Yep. Now, some schools will game that. And the net result of it is that when you get concentrations of pocket of advantage, like you've described in some of those schools, they are naturally going to succeed. You know, there's a school in Sydney, um, and you would have the same in Brisbane and all those uh, capital, uh, all states and territories would have them, where just about every year they come top of whatever your matriculation is, a year 12 results. Well, it's because those kids are seriously academically selected, and the problem would be if they didn't come out on top of it because they come in with a huge amount of resources. You know, often I was asked as a, as a principal and now as an academic, what would be one thing that parents could do to help their kids? read to them, ask them what they enjoyed about their learning, be engaged productively with them about their learning. You know, there are going to be some parents who say, well, I get to algebra and I'm out. I can't help my kids with the homework. That's okay. But being interested with them has a far more significant impact than just letting them go off and do their work on their own. You know, we talk about that PISA, that OECD, when they started that ray back in the turn of the century, you know, they, they thought, how do we measure what's a, an advantaged uh, family? And one proxy measure that they used, Andrew, is how many books you have in your home. Amazing, amazing. And they found that the more books that families have in their homes, the more that they would be deemed to value education and therefore more likely to be a culture in which those kids are going to be engaged in their learning. Yep. If you've got families who, A, are not themselves necessarily interested in it, B, hostile towards the school and are going to get their, give a gobful to the teacher or the principal every opportunity they can, why would we be surprised that those kids are not necessarily advancing well in their education? It is Peter from Emerald. Peter, are you there? Ah, uh, yeah. What would you like to ask Dr. Paul today? Uh, look, I like to try and be involved with my kids' schooling. Um, I, we're having a lot of issues at the moment, uh, health-wise, with both of them. They both have anxiety. They're both on their autism spectrum. And my eldest... When you say to her, how was school today? What did you do? You pretty much get no answer. It's like, nah, it was all right. Nah, don't know. Don't know what I did. How do you approach that? Look, a great question, Peter. And, and uh, let me tell you, sadly, uh, you're in a boat with a lot of people. Uh, and particularly as kids get through their adolescence, it's often an ability to be able to reframe it around, tell me something that you did in class today. Show me something that you did in your, your book. Uh, you know, tell me something that you really enjoyed 
even, and, and you won't be stuck with an answer for this one, tell me something you're unhappy with today. Kids will be pretty forthcoming with that. As trying to get them to be a little bit more connected and, and specific, where there are those opportunities to engage with you know, parent information nights, parent teacher, um, great schools, regardless of whether they're public schools, Christian schools, other types of schools that have a relationship between the home and the school that is open, that's positive, that's the best place to start and being able to engage. There are other times as well where sometimes the kids don't want to talk and that's okay. Just give them the time and space. But if they know that they care, if they know that you care, they'll at some point be able to open up uh, even just a little gem. Take it when it comes, Peter, and maybe that might build yeah. some further encouragement. So basically just keep trying to touch base with them and hopefully they'll come out. Yeah, look, there was a, a great book written predominantly for, for boys' adolescents and it was called He'll Be Okay. Now, I've got three adult sons and when they went through adolescence, they, they do, and we could talk a lot about some other stuff with their brain and their chemistry, neurochemistry and stuff, but most of them come out okay. They do want to know just that you care and that you'll be there when they're ready to talk. Yeah. And for those yeah. listeners that do have boys in particular, one of the devices that's often very helpful is Go for a drive. Try to get them distracted and uh, not looking face to face at you. And that's also the case for a number of kids for whom, particularly as you've described, Peter, kids with some of those socially challenging uh, dynamics that they've got. If you are just part of their life being available when they're ready to chat and frustrating as that often is, they're not always ready at the time that we feel like it. Sometimes it can be 10.30 when you want to get them into bed. Can I just have a bit of a chat, Dad? Sure. That sounds great. <laughs> and there are limits, you know, you don't want to be up at 1am, but let's let's be clear, being available when they're ready to talk and using every opportunity when you can is in a positive way. All right. Thank you very much. Peter, can I ask, how many kids have you got? I've got two. I've got a, a daughter that's about, oh, she turns 14 in June, so she pretends, or thinks she's 24. Um only twenty four. Gee, that's 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 young yeah. in her mind. <laughs> and and my son, he's um, turns twelve on Friday. Yeah, but we're having a lot of. He can't attend school at the moment because he has um, a thing called FND, um, functional neurological disorder, and he's basically a lot of the time in a toddler state, so it's pretty stressful. But yeah. And, and let me add, Peter, having heard that uh, there is always the need to engage with professionals, medical practitioners, yeah. uh, paramedical practitioners, and that's why we talk about education. You know, the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. It absolutely yeah. takes it as well to educate them in a cont context like we are now and taking every opportunity to use those services, to use the insights of those professionals. They've got some great insights as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're do, we we are doing all that with psychologists and psychiatrists and you name it. But um, but it's just going to be a long road. Yeah. Well, Peter, we really appreciate you calling in today. And uh, look, I'm a parent of three, Peter, and I'll tell you what, I'm not writing a book on how to be a good parent because it's a, it's one of those things you just do your best, and there's no easy answers. And we just pray for our kids, and we love them. And we do our best, but I really want to thank you for, for calling in today and, and, and just sharing your thoughts and your challenges with us. All right. Thank you very much. Good on you, Paul. Yeah. We are taking calls today. Maybe you've got a question or a comment for our guest, who is Dr. Paul Kitson, a senior lecturer at the Australian Catholic University. He's also a former school principal. You can get us today on one 800 316, 316. Paul, we're, uh, we are approaching the news, but have you got another thought you just want to share now? Like, what is another challenge facing education in Australia today? I, I think the increasing sense of disruption that you referred to from that Senate inquiry is often characterised as kids throwing chairs around, it's mayhem. It's not that. It's often the kid who just forgets to bring their calculator three times of the week. It's the kid poking the other kid in the back of the chair. It's all these types of micro behaviours that mean 
you know, in a secondary school, if you've got a 45, 50 minute lesson and you spend 20 minutes of it just getting the kids to be on task. And this issue, I think a lot of the digital stuff that's around the shortness of the attention span, um, that's that's uh, kind of combined with the fact that this hostility that some an increasing number of families have towards the school. These are two dynamics that I think we've got to come to an honest appraisal of and say until we deal with those, whatever outcomes we want lifting PISA, improving that plan, they're not going to happen. Yeah, and I think really a lot of those issues are flowing out of challenging home environments where there's a breakdown in the family unit, there's a breakdown in discipline in the home and and kids come into the classroom often, from my observation again, carrying this stuff from home and it, it manifests itself, doesn't it, in the disruption, in the not wanting to listen, not wanting to cooperate. And, gee, there's no easy answers for the uh, the breakdown in our society, is there? No, and, and, you know, again, ironically, at the same time, we found this through COVID. For some kids for whom life at home is really tough, school is actually a safe haven. And so for them to be in school where they're loved, they're cared for, they're nurtured, they're protected is, for some of them, sadly, uh, the, the opposite of what they experience when they're at home. And, that, and that's what makes things challenging because if I've got a group of 30 kids in my in my care. I'm going to have kids who are flying on all levels and I'm going to have kids that are drowning on all levels and everywhere in between. Paul, it looks like we've got a call from a young lady called Katie from Victoria. And Katie, have you got a question for Dr. Paul today? Uh, hi, Paul and Andrew. Sorry, yeah, I'm not that young. I'm 54, but thank you. <laughs> well, Moses lived to be 120, Katie, so I'm calling you young, okay? You've got a long yeah, way to go well, before you I get to that age. Like I'm kind of getting started. Um, I just want to throw a few things out there. Sorry, this is probably going to jump around a bit. I raised up four children mostly by myself, uh, two boys and two girls, and two of them mostly went to school and two were mostly homeschooled. And I made a lot of mistakes. So they did. They had some Catholic education, some public school education, some... You know, um, yeah, and some and some homeschooling, quite a lot of homeschooling for the two younger ones. So and yeah, they're all they're all on different paths at the moment. But anyway, I just want to say, as far as the reading side goes, um, they're all good readers and they're all good at maths. But one of the things I did with reading, and I'm not saying that to brag, it's just my mother was a primary school teacher, so I think that helped. We've got a few teachers in our family, but. With the two older children, when I was struggling to find time to read with my second child, because my oldest child was a good reader, I got her to do the readers with my son. And I mean, I'm talking like grade one and prep. I know that sounds like irresponsible parenting. Um, Yeah, I did end up actually homeschooling down the track. And I actually found out that I could actually get paid to do that. Now, I think things have changed in the system. Like, I was actually, Centrelink paid me to homeschool my kids, which was amazing. And the first person I spoke to said, no, you can't do it. And then someone said, we'll call you in 28 days. And someone else called me back in an hour and said, yes, we can, you can be approved to do that. But the other thing I want to say is this. Well, hang on. Let's go, back, let's go back to that first point. Sorry? So you've actually encouraged one of your young children to help a younger child to read. Paul, what are your thoughts on, on getting young kids to help other young kids learn how to read? I, just, I think you're spectacular. You've done a terrific job on so many levels. Um, one of the most powerful ways uh, that we know from uh, research evidence that kids do learn is through this notion of peer tutoring or peer mentoring. And so the ability to have a a child who's a little further on in their development to be able to support a younger child um, is terrific. And I have to say, uh, going back and listening to your history, uh, the the teachers in the family, uh, they're, they're all the sorts of, if you like, background strengths and valuing of education that we were talking about before the news. You know, families who like to read, and even though it may not necessarily be new, but being able to value that practice that process and have your older child be part of that you know ironically it also helps their skill development as well yep so there you go the principal the school principal was happy with that so there's a tick there for you katie so what was your your second say something about the youngest girl and the two youngest kids because when i was homeschooling they used to go to the library i bought a lot of books that were actually being gotten rid of from the library you know they were selling them off because they didn't want them anymore 
So for a dollar each, I'd go and buy 50 books at a time. I still have some of them, actually. But the youngest two children would go, and I think at one stage she had 30-something books out. On, like, So, yeah, and of course I tried to monitor what they were reading and listen to them. And, and I know not every parent has time. And the only other thing I would say is pray. Do Bible studies with your children if you can. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's, and confidence yeah. in parenting, that God has given you. And I did not do everything right. All my children are struggling in different ways at the one moment, so I don't want to say I've done everything right. Um, far from it. I'm actually still trying to sort out some of my own issues. I'm doing Celebrate Recovery, which is a Christian version of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's not just for alcoholics, it's for all. So that's the only other thing I would say, that because I didn't sort out some of my past trauma, it's affected my kids. So, Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Yeah, and, and look, Katie, again, um, a great tribute to you that notwithstanding some of those other um, challenges that are there, you've put in place some rich foundations. What is fundamental in our understanding of, of uh, education in a faith lens is that families are the first educators. That is always the most um, imperative thing to be ex to be expressed. As you described, going to the library, getting all these books, all the cast-offs that they get from the library, the, the, the kids have got this rich trove of, of ideas and information that they can access. You know, there was years ago a, a famous movie with Sean Connery called The Name of the Rose, and the author of that book uh, was reported to have a personal library of 30,000 books, and he was, he was kind of criticised, saying, well, you can't possibly read all those books. What does that do? And he says, it actually helps give me intellectual humility. Because as much as I know, this reminds me every day that there's still more to know, and that isn't doesn't begin to consider the uh, you know the omniscience that God has. You know, when we're engaged in in reading and a culture of reading, we always want more. My wife says to me, "How many books can you have?" And I always say, "More." You know, because they're such rich sources that you might have, even if you haven't read every single paragraph in them. Yeah, and look, you, none of us are perfect, Katie, but to me, it sounds like you, you did a really good job. You did your best. You encouraged them to read. You borrowed books for them, and you prayed for them. You did Bible studies with them, and uh, I just want to say kudos to you, Katie. None of us are perfect, and God was perfect, and he had kids, and they didn't end up perfect either, Adam and Eve, nor did you know, Cain and Abel. So, But I want to thank you so much for calling in today, Katie. We have another caller on the line, Thanks but we really, really appreciate you calling in and just wish you all the best on your, on your future journey with your kids as well. Thank you so much. Now, we've got another caller on the line, and it is Chris from Melbourne, Victoria. Have you got a comment or a question for Dr. Paul today, Chris? Well, I just got a bit of a general um, comment that uh, I think this has been happening for quite a while now, the dumbing down of the population, because in the West, it's, if you dumb down the population, it's easy to control, you know. Uh, people who are dumbed down, well, they're satisfied with the crumbs. They don't think they can eat at the master's table, so... Um, this is what I think, you know, that's why every day I ask, uh, thank God that I have the mind of Christ, not because I want to be Einstein and send a rocket to the moon or anything, but I just want to be able to discern the plans of the enemy. Thank you. Excellent good comment. Chris. Yeah, very good, Chris. You got a, a response to that, Dr. Paul? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, the, the phrasing of dumbing down is, is, you know, a reasonable one in many regards. There's also new information that comes along that we have to assimilate. We have to put it into what we already know, and that's an ongoing project as well. But, you know, if we go back to one of the fundamental stories out of the patriarchy from the early stages of the Old Testament, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Tell these stories to your children. Tell them again and again. And if we don't continue to tell where we've come from, then we only end up with the new. And it's this dialogue between the old and the new that we have. You know, remarkably, the Bible doesn't mention generative AI, but theologians have got to have some vision about how we deal with this. Um, and that goes very much to Chris's comment that, you know, if we just become so receptive, we just take whatever is given to us, we don't engage. Education's hard work. You know, it's, it's, it requires some discipline, it requires some effort. And again, I think we see too much evidence that some kids, and indeed some families, just go, it's too hard, I'm not going to push it on. 
Yeah, it's an interesting stat I read once was that in America, again, there was a great awakening in the 19th century and many people turned to Christ, many people went to church. And in the churches, the kids were learning in the Sunday schools, the, the kids' churches. And because of that, there was a very high rate of literacy amongst the kids of America in about 1890 compared to the rest of the world. And the only reason they're more literate than the rest of the world wasn't because they were Americans or because they were smarter. It's because they went to church and they were taught the Bible as young kids. And of course, we move into the 20th century and America becomes the powerhouse of the world economically because there were so many intelligent thinking people who were read and had a broader perspective on life and, and were able to do better in life. So I think, as, uh, as Chris said, the dumbing down in our society, I think it started with people not reading their Bibles as much as the average Aussie read their Bible, say, 50, 60 years ago. And I think that's something that, uh, God willing, we need to address as a society as well. Yeah, and there's, there's certainly, going back even a little further than that, uh, and there's um, uh, a shift when the Industrial Revolution comes along and we've now got all these kids and we've got to do something with them. They're working in the mines, they're working in these factories, and there is actually a very strong uh, Christian social conscience that says this is not really what we ought to be doing. Now, again, a well-intended uh, priority, give these kids some fundamental uh, education, what ends up happening, particularly in Australia in the 1870s and 1880s, is we then get the state governments, or they were still colonial governments at that time, they assume responsibility for that education. Prior to then, most education that was provided was provided through various church traditions, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, Church of England, the Roman Catholics, and then these free compulsory and secular um, uh, acts of parliament make it so that everybody has to go. If we go back to uh, Katie earlier on, even to homeschool my children, there's been a significant growth of homeschooling, requires me to get government approval because it's enshrined in legislation that I have to be at a school that the government has identified is an acceptable uh, place to learn. So there's some real, you know, complex challenges there. How do I as a family, how do I as a parent exercise my right as a parent when I've got these other legal requirements, sometimes that don't always easily stack up against one another. Uh, it's a complex world. But uh, Chris, if you're still there, I want to thank you for calling in today. We really appreciate your comment on 2020 today. No problem, Andrew. Thank you. God bless you, mate. Yeah, I want to raise, uh, I want to segue out of this now uh, to another area of Australian society, and that is the role models that our kids are facing today, um, Paul. Because let's be honest, if you turn on the, the news and you watch our politicians conduct themselves in public, some of their behaviour is not great. And so how do we expect our kids to behave well in a classroom setting with other individuals there when our own politicians sometimes aren't behaving well? And I believe you've written an article on this recently as well. I was incensed about it. You know, I, I, having, having presented to the Senate inquiry... I was driving home and, you know, as is my desire, listening to the Senate, question time, and one of the senators asked the president, can you please get, the, the language he used is, can you please turn the temperature down? They literally were shouting at each other. And when the president would say, order, you've got to be quiet, they just completely ignored it. And I just thought, what right do these people have to make determinations about what should be going on in schools regarding disruption because they can't even demonstrate it in their own you know uh, workplace i'm also part of a major research project on principal health and well-being and our report will come out in another couple of weeks and what we look at there is this issue of the role modeling one of the issues the role modeling that parents give is the reason why some kids themselves are hostile towards their teachers and the principal and one other story briefly a teacher says to a student, where do you want to go in life? I want to do that. You need to move forward. You've got to do some harder work. Complains to the parents. Parents complain to the principal. Principal calls the teacher and says, apologise to the parents. Now, when I was told that story, my response to that was, that kid has got no hope of being able to take a positive attitude into their learning because they know if it's too hard or they don't want to do it, mum and dad or the caregiver or whoever is backing them at home is going to come down with a big stick and beat the school up. Yeah. Whatever policy the government has and wants to achieve is not going to happen when there are too many of those types of situations. Yeah, and two really good points, but I especially like the politician point because you're right. These people get paid a lot of money 
to be the political leaders of Australia and they can't even respect one another enough to let each other speak. And uh, I think that needs to be pushed a little bit further, actually. I think we need to develop that, that maybe we should uh, be imposing some sort of laws on our politicians that if they conduct themselves in certain ways like that, that there's penalties for it. But before we touch on that, folks, it's a really good point. We have another caller and we have got Tanya from Happy Valley in South Australia. I've never been to Happy Valley, but it sounds like an amazing place. Tanya, are you there? Have you got a comment today? Yes, look, good morning. Um, I'm an ex-teacher role. I'm still registered, but I'm not teaching currently. Um, I got caught up in some of the COVID stuff a few years ago, so I had to sort of step away for mental health reasons. But um, I look, I, I'm hearing exactly what you're saying. And from the moment I started teaching... I found the conundrum even in within schools um, that were trying to impose, you know, good behaviour management skills on children, but there was rifts and, you know, just so much disharmony within the school system itself that I just used to go, what's going on? How can we be teaching children to live harmoniously and love each other and be kind to each other if we can't even as teachers do that to each other? So, yeah, on a larger scale, the, the, the government system is the same. So you found the culture within the school you were working in fairly toxic and, and not harmonious. So you found it almost ironic that you were trying to teach kids to work in harmony and work together when the, that the staff in the school you're in weren't even working together. Exactly, yeah. There was there were so many risks at the time. And I remember it was my first school and it was up in the... Um, in the outback in Cooper Pedy, if you know where Cooper Pedy is, in the Opal Field, that was my first spot, my first gig, uh, government school. And, you know, there was there were just so many rifts amongst the teachers and the, the um, hierarchy of the school that uh, we had Harmony Day, ironically, to be celebrating. And I just found myself getting a CD of, um, I think it was the Columbine Massacre, one of the school songs that came out of that. Um, and I just played it on loop all day long and I wrote this little message to people to come in and just sit and just reflect on our own behaviour, <laughs> that we as teachers are meant to be exemplary. We're meant to be those role models to those children and how can we expect them to try and work out differences if we can't do the same thing? Well, wow. Paul, have you got a comment you want to make in response to Tanya's experience there? Uh, with the time available, and I've got way too many comments about that, uh, one of the first things I'd say is we also have a really sad history uh, within schools, and I really appreciate that you're talking about the relationship between teachers and, and uh, again, perhaps even school leaders. Um, we don't talk enough, I think, about how power continues to be exercised in a misuse, abusive manner. You know, we had a royal commission into poor responses that schools, government and non-government schools had about children entrusted into their care. We've had a whole range of these other uh, projects that have gone on for a time that say the, the relationship in schools is both the most central part and the most likely to be abused. And when it does get abused, you end up with the types of damage that unfortunately it sounds as if uh, uh, Tanya have experienced and, and, and that's a sad thing. A school in its ideal state is a positive, cooperative, collaborative place to be. And we need to learn how to live with people who are different than us. You know, wouldn't it be great if everybody just saw the world the way that I like it? Well, it doesn't happen that way, you know, and that's both in in terms of uh, uh, students and families and teachers and being able to agreeably disagree is an art form that we seem to have lost some of us along the way as well. Yeah, I think a leadership has a lot to do with it too because I've always said what filters down from the top sort of infects the rest. And if you haven't got really good leadership happening, you I mean, it's the same with our government system as well. If people aren't leading and understand their role as role models within our government system, how can we ever be expecting that they, what the, the policies they come out with are sound? So, yeah, this was 20 years ago for me, but that, I just reflected on the yeah. fact that when I first started 20-odd years ago as a teacher, this was my first experience, and I remember thinking, wow, how can it be this way? How has not everyone got their case yeah. of, I don't know, we're, we're the role models for these people and to families as well. How can we not be trying to sort our differences out or agree to disagree, as you said? 
Yeah, and, and some people don't like the language of vo vocation about teaching. I do. It's a really old word that has a power to it because it's about calling and it's about service and it's about the sense of, I think what's fundamental about the notion of Christian grace is I'm doing something for the benefit of others, not necessarily for any benefit that I will receive in response. Now, yeah. we, in many regards, that is not as much of a rich feature of the conversation that I think would be healthy to have. We've got some of those leadership, absolutely, as you say, Tanya, is responsible for creating or sustaining or not eradicating uh, toxic cultures. And yeah. that needs to be addressed. And that needs to be addressed, I think, right through the lens of grace, which says, I am here. That's right at the core of our Christian faith. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and I think uh, also, you know, you mentioned that vocation. You know, the Bible says that we should work as unto the Lord. I suppose, ideally, every Christian, whether they're a nurse, a teacher, a doctor, a police officer, whatever we do in life, or a radio presenter, we should be working as unto the Lord, shouldn't we? And we should be doing it out of a sense of calling and obedience to Him, and navigating our way through the many challenges which do present themselves in a, in a secular workplace. But I really want to thank you, uh, Tanya, for calling in today. We always love callers. And I don't know what's going on in Happy Valley, but gee, it sounds like a nice place. Happy Valley. I'd love to live in a place called Happy. It's a great, it's a great start to a description for a location. But God bless you, Tanya. We love our callers down there in South Australia. Really appreciate you calling in today. Thank you. Paul, just before we uh, finish up today, have you got any closing thoughts or comments you want to make about uh, modern education? Yeah, I, I, I go back to where we started. I, I think uh, one of our great challenges at the moment is there is such societal change, uh, there is such technological change, uh, we seem to be becoming more suspicious of people, we seem to be becoming more fractured as a community. Um, it doesn't strike me as particularly novel then that we see that happening in our schools. I think what we do have is an opportunity for our schools to be places of, of hospitality, places of care. We've got to realise that some of those families, whilst they are themselves a bit broken, sending broken kids to school, there's a rich opportunity for us to serve them. And so it's the, the same plate, but we're looking at the other side of it. And uh, seeing the rich possibilities that there are requires that strong sense of vocation. It re requires a strong sense of you are imago dei. You are made in the image of God. And it is my responsibility uh, to serve you as best we can and to do that as collectively and positively. Is that naive and optimistic? Unashamedly. <laughs> but I think that's why we've got to continue to push towards that. Uh, education is not about getting a job. Education is about being a life and yeah. being a human person in response to the creative genius of God. Yeah, look, all I can say to that is yes. Uh, as a kid in a school, in a primary school, I still remember the really positive role models that the teachers were. Yeah, at that time, my family life wasn't very happy. There was a lot of sadness and dysfunctionality. And I, I mean, I can mention the names of the teachers. I don't even know if they're still alive. Mr. Wenning and Mr. Shea, I still remember their names. And I just remember the time they took to tell us stories, the time they took to encourage us and to encourage me. And, and looking back, they, they were stable. They were adults. They weren't losing their temper. They weren't going crazy. They were balanced. They were obviously educating us and informing us, but they had such a positive impact on my life. And I wasn't a Christian back then. I don't even know if those men were Christians, but they sowed some really positive seeds in my life. And I just know there's lots of teachers out there today Paul, and I'm sure having been one yourself, sometimes you'd scratch your head and wonder, gee, am I making any difference here? Am I, any, am I doing anything positive? But I promise you, you are. And if there's anyone out there today listening, you're a teacher, maybe you're not at work today, or maybe you're thinking of studying teaching, or maybe you've got a kid who's a school teacher, tell them to keep going because they definitely are sowing positive seeds. And I never saw those teachers again after primary school, but I still look back on those times, Paul, as really positive times in my life with those teachers showing an interest in my life. Andrew, I'll give you a piece from a, um, a departed Catholic scholar, passed away late last year. I heard him speak recently before, he, just recently before he passed away, and he said, schools should be a sacrament of hope. I reckon that's a nice phrase on which to wrap it up. It's beautiful, beautiful. Dr. Paul Kitson, a senior lecturer in educational leadership at the Australian Catholic University and a former school principal. I want to thank you so much for joining us on 2020 today. Is there any way that people can reach out to you and contact you through a website or, or something? Yeah, I'm 
Yes, yes, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So if you just go to uh, Paul Kidson and I post a whole bunch of things about a whole bunch of stuff uh, fairly regularly. Um, and my email address at the university is paul.kidson, K-I-D-S-O-N, at acu.edu.au. You can find me at the Australian Catholic University or on LinkedIn. I'm delighted. Thanks very much for having me along. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.